Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in to our seventh iteration of conversations that we've been holding with local peace builders all around the world on how they're responding to the COVID impact. My name is Christian Chito. I am the program advisor for Conducive Space for Peace, a Danish-based organization that works on transforming the global peace building system to create the agency of local peace builders. Before we get started, if you're joining us for the first time, I would like also to remind to you that these iterations of discussions have been started in April uh, together with Peace Direct and Humanity United through some series of online consultations that we held with 400 local peace builders from 60 countries in which we raised uh, local peace builders raised recommendations on how local, uh, how community leaders, how government leaders, institutional donors, and bilateral actors can join them in how they're responding to the pandemic. So I will leave the report, the link to the report in the comment section. And now, without further ado, I will move to our amazing panelists. I'll ask uh, them to introduce themselves. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Beatrice, if you don't mind, maybe say a few words about yourself, where you're calling us from, where you're joining us from, and tell us how has the, the COVID uh, pandemic impacted you, your community, and your peace building work? Well, um, thank you so much, Christian, for this invite. How are you, everyone? And um, my name is Beatrice Satiano. I am streaming in from Kenya, and I work with an organization called um, Africa Center for Nonviolence and Sustainable Impact. In short, we call ourselves AFRINOV, and we are working in different regions in Kenya, Nairobi, western part of Kenya, North Rift, and western. Um, <clears throat> this organization uh, works with uh, grassroots, community groups to advocate for social justice and um, so uh, what we do is we work with uh, already existing groups and these groups could be youth groups women groups people living with disability and um how COVID-19 has impacted me personally is first it has impacted me uh, both uh, negative and positively so I would like to mention about some of the positive things that uh, this pandemic has exposed me to is, um, mm, first of all, I wasn't uh, so much into um, the online activities that are positive online activities. And I must say that uh, when this pandemic came in, I, no, I was wondering about myself. Now, what am I going to do with myself? Because I am working from home. And this is something that I'm, I don't know, how am I going to do it? It's something that I've never done. And uh, so I started just getting online and trying to find something positive in regards to my work, something that I could. So I came across during this process, I came across different platforms of peace building. And I registered in quite a number and I managed to do quite a number of online, free online courses, basically. And others are paid on, one of it is still ongoing. And um, at the same time, and that is how I came uh, into contact with uh, CSP Conducive Space for Peace as well. So I think um, this is, to me, it is positive. And negatively is because I didn't know how I'm, go how I'm going to work. And so um, there are so many interruptions at, at home. You have work assignments to do. And uh, sometimes you are tempted to go and do some house calls and all that. So you leave your work pending and you have a deadline to beat. So this has been a challenge for quite some time. And it is something that I'm still trying to cope up with. And again, uh, personally, it has also changed my social life. I am just uh, looking at my neighbors. I can't go to my neighbor's house. I can shake their hands and so many things around. So um, and uh, with my community, what I see with my community is um, I look at the community around me 
And I also see that this social distancing has actually affected many people because it's like people have developed some kind of stress with it, but because they don't need to have virus, who does not have virus. So uh, uh, this is really, um, meeting from far and probably uh, I mean, taking uh, uh, I mean, meeting with elders and people have been modified different ways of meeting each other. And this is something that is sometimes you have to get you get me and hug me. And once mm -hmm. you have you are attracted to something like that. All right. And again, uh, uh, if you don't mind, Beatrice, uh, uh, we're hearing some background in. Uh, background echo from your computer probably but if you don't mind we'll get back to that because that's going to be definitely a little bit part of the bulk of the sharing thank you so much right. again for sharing a little bit more about how you're coping with COVID-19 first of all you've said it has some positive impact and also some negative impact on the positive note you've noted how you've been able to access some learning and this is great but also on the on the negative side you as a mother at home and dealing with other things at home it has also been a very disrupting kind of an experience uh, for you to be able to both do the housework at the same time and take care of the kids now let's go to Dishani as well if you don't mind also introducing yourself very briefly telling us uh, where you're calling us from and how has the COVID pandemic impacted you and your community in during this time? And what are you doing to keep yourself um, mentally strong, if you may? It's wonderful to be here. I hope uh, everyone is safe and sound during these uh, difficult times. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to uh, get connected to uh, a diverse audience, transcending uh, geographic boundaries. So uh, my organization is Writing Dubs, which is based in Sri Lanka. It, it, uh, it seeks to uh, enhance intercultural understanding among young learners through trilingual narratives, narratives which are published in Sinhala, Tamil, and English. So we use the technique of storytelling to approach the children and uh, it's done in a very interactive manner so that they get to know the ethnic and religious to get to know other ethnic and religious uh, backgrounds through our stories and moving back to your question so i feel that countries are in different situations right now and uh, as a middle income country uh, covid 19 has posed major challenges to sri lanka and some of the worst affected sectors are tourism as well as the informal sector. People who uh, uh, earn a living on a daily basis. Uh, so a great number of people have lost their sources of income and there's a very profound sense of insecurity. Uh, which leads to the question that uh, can we talk about peace when there is no food on the table? And people dwell on the economic impact. But I'm also worried about the shadow pandemic, which is not very visible. For example, the spike in gender-based violence and violence against children. Uh, the rise in these uh, incidents uh, show that women and children are vulnerable during times of crisis. And if we, if we look at social media, uh, minorities are sometimes projected as vectors of disease, which will breed extremism. And this extremism will outlast the pandemic. And this is a very dangerous development as I see it. Unfortunately, uh, provocative content uh, plays well in social media, whereas peace builders or uh, positive stories, positive narratives have to struggle for attention. So that's something that I have witnessed. And at the moment, speaking about our work, at the moment we are uh, redefining and adapting our approach. As Beatrice mentioned, we are at a very early stage because we have never done this online mode before, the online approach before. So it's new to us, but still we are learning because we are learning 
on a daily basis. And I feel that COVID-19 has provided an impetus for us to think outside of the box. And shifting to the online mode, we have to understand that it's, it's not a very inclusive approach because not everybody has access to internet. Having access to internet and stimulating certain content, so we have to bear that in mind as well. So I think our yeah. goal should be inclusive, gender sensitive, and content sensitive at all times, not just during a pandemic. Fantastic. Thank you so much indeed, Tishani, for raising all these questions and issues that uh, communities are grappling with. One of the points that I take note of is what you've talked earlier about how the pandemic has also foreshadowed a lot of challenges that communities are grappling with. One is, for example, domestic violence and domestic abuse, which are not necessarily talked of. And most particularly, women are the ones who are affected. Children are the ones who are affected the most. Now, I want to take us from that note, maybe to hear a little bit more from your own specific context. Uh, what have been some creative responses that have been used or have been applied to highlight some of these uh, challenges that communities and individuals, particularly women and children, uh, are facing during this period of the pandemic. And uh, maybe to hear from you, uh, Beatrice, if you may want to start, what has been, uh, maybe from your organization's point of view, been some of the ways you've helped creatively address or highlight some of these challenges? Okay. Um... <laughs> Christian, thank you. And um, indeed, as I was talking, I'm so sorry about the background um, interruptions that was coming out. I hope that now uh, you can be able to hear me clearly. Good. Okay. Um, first, um, I was go I was trying to share with you some of the impacts that uh, this has caused uh, in my, my work, and uh, like. In my work, my work is based right at the grassroots. And I am used to going down there where people are and talk to them and do whatever kind of activity that we have arranged. So uh, this pandemic has placed us in a different platform, digitalizing. So we have tried being creative as an organization to come up with platforms, WhatsApp platforms for conversations with our grassroots groups, but still we are getting some challenges out of this. One, because this is not a common way that people are used to. People are not used to, I mean, using, um, I mean, conversing through digital platforms, and this is new. And one, someone may be willing, yes, but probably they do not have the right forms to do it. And again, probably they do not have um, network, bundles, Wi-Fi, and all that. So it limits them towards engaging actively on what we would wish to discuss. So these are some of the limitations that we have as an organization. And um, <clears throat> again, uh, now back to your question on um, about some of the creative responses that we've been able to, uh, to use during this pandemic. Yes, um, now uh, we have been placed in a position now to start thinking critically as an organization, moving away from the usual way of doing things. Yeah, the usual way of sitting down and gathering, mm -hmm. it's no longer there. Probably it might come later, yes, but things are going to change. Social distancing is going to take some time, probably to diminish. So what we have been doing as an organization, because we are engaging with different kinds of groups, including the youth, who have, who have creative skills of uh, doing the activities. Like I said before, we are working with existing groups. So we've identified different kinds of groups with different skills. And one of, our, of, our, of the youth groups that we are working with right now has done an amazing work with their creative arts. So they employ these art skills in, I mean, drawing and writing some of these COVID measures 
on the walls by painting them and letting the people, I mean, just letting people know that um, this is what we are supposed to do uh, during this time. So um, they have identified different ones. They have painted and they have written this information and people are able to read them and probably ask questions where they uh, do not understand. Another methodology that some of our groups are using right now are, I mean, they are writing leaflets, they are printing and writing small leaflets, and I mean, distributing them in different houses, in, diff in, di in, I mean, in different households. Again, um, they, they've also employed a way of going door to door, like in pairs, to go and speak different houses. <laughs> maybe we can, um, yeah. if you don't mind, maybe we can pick from there as well to bring in uh, Ishani as well in the conversation here. A couple points that you've raised right. this is one that uh, part of the creative responses that your community and youth that you involve with have put in place is uh, doing uh, theater, writing leaflets, and going door to door. And I wonder from uh, Dishani's perspective, what have been some of the uh, creative response? Do you see the same methodologies being used in your context? And if you can also share a little bit more what, how effective uh, the approaches that you've used in your context, uh, Dishani, have been to highlighting some of the challenges that especially women and children at home are facing during the pandemic. I guess what's difficult at this point is because we are fighting against an invisible enemy. So uh, creative endeavors uh, may not be the cure because people are looking for a cure. It may not save lives, but it will definitely help us survive and contribute to our psychological well-being. And uh, speaking about children, they have taken up drawing as a medium of self-expression. Uh, indoor photography has also emerged. And for a brief period of time, uh, armed forces entertained people who were con confined to their homes. And songs have been released to evoke the spirit of unity, brotherhood, sisterhood, and good health practices. Uh, in addition, a wave of uh, virtual poetry has also emerged, given that internet is a tool for communication in this day and age. Like Beatrice pointed out, because of nationwide lockdown, people were unable to have uh, in-person gatherings. But as peace builders, I think we have to make sure that we have to ensure that the communities that we work with, uh, that they don't feel alone. And we should not be abandoning them at this point because trust lies at the heart of peace building. We have to be in constantly in touch with them. I also believe that no single work can represent what is what we are experiencing right now. So we need we need more and more dialogue and conversation, which revolves around what we are facing right now. And uh, regarding my work, uh, in uh, next month, a series, the first of a series of children's ebooks, will be launched, and that is a, a small attempt taken. Uh, in this scenario to uh, reach to people, to reach to children who are confined to their domestic sphere so that they have an opportunity to read about, uh, to read and uh, get uh, and to expand their uh, imaginative horizons. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that. And uh, I want to just keep note of what you've added both of you in this conversation when you talk about creative responses uh a few other elements that dishani you've highlighted is there's been songs that have been written we've seen an increase in indoor photography but one thing that you've also pointed to is that there's not one single response that can best address the pandemic that we need some sense of cohesion that we need to interact to have dialogue amongst each other and maybe picking up on that point about dialogue and 
just trying to see it from your context again, to what extent have you seen uh, community leaders, peace builders, international actors coming together in a form of dialogue or in seeking to coordinate efforts together? And if there is any sense of dialogue or coordination of efforts, what have been the creative ways uh, this is happening? One example you could say, for example, and this is something I've heard in a call earlier today, where, for example, in East Africa, we're seeing young people who have been working on the youth peace and security agenda right now using the pandemic and the access to technology they have to create very spontaneous me messages that they can send to uh, policymakers at the African Union and to engage them in a very immediate dialogue because they feel like people are able to listen at this time. Everyone is trying to find a solution and government and policymakers are at least in a position to listen. But this is just from East Africa. But let's bring it to uh, maybe your specific context in Kenya, uh, Beatrice. What examples of coordination have you seen? What example of uh, dialogue that is creative have you seen that is helping to uh, respond to the pandemic? So um, thank you, Christian. So uh, what I maybe probably to get your question clear. So are you trying to find out, um, I mean, in relation to the, our local leaders or just the people in the community? Um, more in relation to your local leaders, because I know from the people in the community, you've talked of examples of methodologies you are reaching out to them, right? Like the door to door. But the next level here is how are actors like community leaders or international actors joining efforts together in a way that is creative to address this pandemic? Okay, uh, basically um, what um, I have noted uh, from my local area, I have seen in one of the local areas where uh, my groups are working, they have been able to engage some of the local leaders. And these are like uh, the chiefs and uh, the ward administrators and the people who are locally within their area, just to talk about how they would be able to respond because they're coming up with ways of uh, trying to support the community. Like we have, uh, there is this, uh, the government relief that is uh, being given to the, um, the people, the, I mean, the vulnerable groups and so uh you see that the community must work the local leaders must work with the communities to be able to identify the right people to benefit from this particular relief and we also have the corona uh, virus money which is uh being given to the vulnerable uh, groups and uh, so these local leaders have able have been able to sit down with some of these groups within their local, the young people, and uh, I mean, the people within the, that particular community to try to come out with the best way of uh, supplying this uh, particular, I mean, uh, benefits to the, to the community. So what they have done is they have had meetings, they have had uh, meetings and of course, observing the social distancing and discussing together with the people, the community, I mean, the group leaders, different group leaders to be able to come out with the best way of reaching out to these I mean, communities. And I am so much um, glad that this has worked with a number of uh, groups and they have been able to be given these opportunities through these local leaders to be able to do a survey to identify what which families are vulnerable and i mean so that they'll be able to reach out to them so this is something that has actually happened and and uh, it is an initiative that has been also encouraged by the community itself because at some point you found that uh, there are some of these leaders are doing some of these things without involving the people the community itself and so you find that there are things that are not being done right. And then it brings some uproar within the community. And so that when this community discovers this, they say, no, we need to sit down 
and talk about this and discuss and forge a way forward on how we can actually do this the best way so that we can reduce the level of conflicts that we're already experiencing in our communities. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Beatrice. I think uh, one key element to take away from that is that there is need for local leaders to engage with their constituents, that this conversation on how to address the pandemic should not just be left to decision makers themselves, but uh, it has to be conclusive and inclusive, sorry, of, uh, of community voices. Now let's go maybe to Dishani as well, but maybe on a different question here. As we think of uh, creative responses, because the purpose of this call is to actually elaborate on the power of creative responses. Maybe you can tell us, uh, how do you think local peace builders who are joining and who are listening and who are really stuck from their homes and losing inspiration, how do you think they can integrate uh, arts in their work to, to start sparking imagination, to start uh, creating space of thinking differently about how to respond to this pandemic? I guess whether or not you want to focus on COVID-19, it's your choice. It's the choice of the artist. It's up to you. Some people may want to talk about it. Some people may want to forget. That's perfectly OK. Uh, uh, taking a, an example from Shakespeare, his life uh, began in the shadow of a pandemic, but he never wrote a play on a pandemic. Uh, there are artists who feel that outside world should not intrude in their work because people may uh, want to ex escape into other experience through artistic in interventions. And I have also seen people uh, questioning the utilitarian value of arts. Uh, yet, I feel that uh, artists have to, and artists have the capability to feed people's minds, to provide food for, food for thought. And if I uh, talk about the Sri Lankan context in Sinhalese caste hierarchy, craftsmen and arts practitioners, they were pushed down to a very low level in ancient times. Mm. But thankfully, the situation has changed. And moving on to some other aspect, whether it's commercial arts or for arts for development, I guess collecting audience impact is a rising trend. And we shouldn't do it not, not necessarily to please our donor agencies or any external stakeholder, but as an opportunity, uh, as an evaluation process for the artist to consider their art from the perspectives of the audience. But it shouldn't be confused with monitoring. So it's totally up to you to uh, engage in your work, whether you uh, whether you put in or whether you add in the current scenario to your work. I think uh, a couple of points here to take away, I guess, is what you've pointed earlier, Dishani, that the choice to use arts or to integrate arts is something that every artist would make in, in their own view. Like, as you point to the example of Shakespeare and how during his time, although he was living at a time when the pandemic was striking his country, he did not necessarily include it. But I think also maybe speaking to a broader audience of, uh, of revolutionary artists, artists were trying as well to, to leave a mark in our time, because this is very a transforming time. And we can use it for the best or for the worst. And I think this is one thing you've highlighted. And I think maybe a question that I'm posing to, to you, and this is also coming from uh, an audience a viewer here who has asked earlier, how can we, as everybody who is interested in arts, use it as well for our mental health? Because uh, one thing that at least has come out very strongly is as people grapple with uncertainty, there is an increase in, in depression, there's an increase in hopelessness. And at times, those who are not habilitated or who don't feel like they, are, they have the artistic skills, they just don't know how to go about empowering themselves. To, to deal with mental health during this time by choosing art. But let's hear maybe from uh, Beatrice, if you have any comments to that, uh, you can go ahead. 
Okay, I will try. I will try and uh, because uh, this pandemic has actually brought us into a very into a step where we have to think, start thinking creatively and I mean in a different way. Uh, so um, I want to take an example of our groups that are doing the acts. First, uh, I would like to bring to your attention that even before this pandemic, we've had groups that have been in, I, I mean, uh, incorporating some of these creative ways in their work, in their activities. Like, for example, as a program, we have uh, trained uh, peace activists in Rwanda and Burundi. And in Rwanda and Burundi, some of the um, popular ways that they're engaging their communities are through songs and dances to, uh, to bring up some of these uh, conversations on and some actions take place, which uh, at the end becomes uh, like a catalyst for peace. So uh, this is something that has been ongoing, yes, but we have not been uh, taking it into consideration like as the most important things that we have to do. So um, I would say that like this group that uses arts, like when they were actually drawing, there were many, they were drawing attention of so many people. There were so many people that were coming closer, wanting to know exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how they came to understand this. And there is, uh, this group tells us that they have, they have, I mean, uh, they have received many requests from many young people who want to support them in doing this, and they also want to be taught on how to draw and how to come up with such creative paintings that probably resonates with the current situations and any other thing or activities or events that might be in place. So this is something that I think, um, because many people are like idle, like they do not have many things, something to do, especially the young people, because most of them probably were used to, to going and do ca some casual work to be able to do, to get something for their living. And right now they are not able to do that. So they are they just seated and wondering what else can I do with my life and all that. So I think if they get opportunities to probably um, use some of the creative uh, skills that they have, it could also help them relieve them from some of the stresses that they are going through in life and all that. So I think it is something that we need to consider in future and see yeah. how it works. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Indeed, uh, I think one element that I take away from your point is that there needs to expose uh, at least some of these creative skills to other who may not have necessarily the same. Uh, we just have yeah. welcomed our brother, Didel, who has had some challenges to join earlier, but uh, we are really uh, approaching actually the very close section of our call today, looking at uh, what we can do to help at least those who are interested in boosting their mental resilience using creative responses, and how can they do it? And one point that we are uh, trying to figure out here is from an artist point of view, or from a communication perspective in your case, uh, how, can we, how can we empower our people to, to deal with the mental health issues that come with uh, with this pandemic, maybe we'll start with you since you haven't had a chance to speak. Can you hear us, Didel? Maybe you can go ahead. Okay, yeah, I, I heard you clearly, Chris. Um, once sorry for coming in late. I had some difficulties trying to log in. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. We can hear you. Yeah. yeah. So if you don't if you don't mind, would you please come again with uh, the question? Because I had some problem hearing you. No worries. So the question I was asking is, we are really uh, trying to figure out ways to empower people who do not necessarily feel uh, artistically skilled enough to deal with mental health challenges that come along with the pandemic. So the question has oh. been, if you're sitting at home and you've just been wondering what to do what, what, what can you really do how can we empower 
those who do not have writing skills or those who do not have singing skills. So they too can deal uh, productively and positively with mental health in this time. Okay, that's good. Um, if I get you correctly, um, I would like to use um, the the case we're having in my community in Nigeria. Um, I've been privileged to work with some some youths who were trying to bring them out of drug addiction, using them as a practical example. Now, um, first of all, those those youths numbering about fifty are unskilled. They are unskilled, but in in my organization, we were trying to find a way to see how we could help them and how they can make good use of this period to create awareness as well for the um, uh, in, in this time of the pandemic. It was quite difficult coming up with a plan, given that um, most of them are school dropouts. They have nothing to do. They, 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 they barely can fend for themselves. And given that... Um, Nigeria, uh, particularly, we, we had a lockdown and so many other opportunities that we preferred to, to, to make this feasible was not possible at the time. Regardless, we found a way that, okay, we could make use of the print media to get these people to do some work and to get them to, to, to spread the message of the, the COVID-19. Um, we had to seek permission from um, the local authorities where they gave out, um, uh, uh, they further gave permission to the print media houses, the ones close by to us to, 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 to work. And we're able to make some designs, which I would share much later with um, in, on the platform. We're able to make some designs, create some awareness messages on the print media. It was heavily graphic because, um, the communities, the targeted communities, are not um, are, are not. I think we might have lost uh, Didel there. Uh, can you hear us, Didel? But uh, hopefully, you can connect and continue. Are not people who could? Well, yes, go ahead. Didel. We, we lost you there for a second. Oh, you can, you can. Okay. okay. So we're able to make good use of the print here. Yeah? And with that, we printed um, messages across using posters, handbills, and all that. And we used these this youths in, in, in this uh, program to disseminate this information to the public. And I would say it, was, it is yielding results. Uh, in the long run, it was able to get this youth busy, given that they are dropouts. Most of them are uneducated. In fact, all of them are uneducated, but they're able to get their hands busy doing something. And it took them off the street. And it is yielding impact. It is yielding impact. I would say... We I think we're still uh, struggling to... We've had a print, uh, printing and get more copies so we can disseminate in the communities. So that's, that's what I have about that question. No, thank you very much, Didel. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I think it was quite clear. Uh, the work that you're doing, especially with sensitizing uh, youth who are at risk, youth who are on the streets, and giving them something meaningful to do through your work of uh, sensitizing. And you've talked about graphic communication that you've used to making sure these messages actually gets across. The point that I think is also important, and this is also something I want to hear from our panelists, and uh, I'm going to bring in Dishani here now. Uh, when you talk about uh, empowering communities, empowering individuals to, to be able to, to develop this artistic resilience and being able to, to deal with mental health, I don't know if you have any advice to that. And also, if you can speak to this other question that Didel has raised, in your context in Sri Lanka, have you seen some kind of resistance to, uh, to the pandemic? At least in many places across Africa, we're seeing communities who do not think, for example, that the pandemic can, or young people don't think that the pandemic will affect them. And it has been a misconception that is so deeply ingrained that sometimes even uh, civil society organizations are finding really a hard time to making sure that people take preventive measures seriously. So maybe the two the twofold question is one, how do we empower communities to deal with the mental health challenges using arts? 
And two, how do we then deal with the misconceptions and the stereotype and, and the misleading information that has been passing as well through internet and technology, which actually exposes more people to the pandemic? So let's start with you, Dishan, if you may. In these difficult times, I believe the role of a practitioner of arts as a change agent is very crucial because they can ask right questions during the most extraordinary of times. They can also be a voice for the voiceless, speak for the unspeakable, focus on uh, uncomfortable truths and challenge dominant narratives and accepted realities so that people will can relate to such work and feel that okay this artist this work reflects our problems our socio-economic problems so that uh, sense of uh, connection is very important both for the artist and for people at this point i feel that arts is an ideal medium to narrate difficult and marginalized stories and uh, for some people arts can be essential as food uh, or medicine or even shelter but of course i i understand that it's tied to your socioeconomic status but having said that i i strongly believe that arts can bring people together heal their wounds and act as a bridge between the past and the present. And going to your uh, other question on, on, the, on resistance. On resistance. So I, I, I think that this term which has come up, uh, it's the infodemic, the misinformation junk news which is being spread at this moment. I, I believe it's very difficult to, to tackle this things just by legislation because people somewhere out there are very uh, good at uh, making divisions among people rather than bringing them together. I guess, uh, like I mentioned, if minorities are projected as vectors of disease, it will lead to extremism, which is not a good development, which is not a very, uh, very good trend. I feel that communities, uh, this uh, we shouldn't uh, tap COVID-19 as a strategy to gain political advantages. Rather, we should transform it as an opportunity to change existing dynamics. Absolutely. Indeed, I think, and I fully agree with you on that, uh, that uh, the pandemic should not be taken as a strategy. One thing that I, you've also pointed to is that uh, arts is definitely a potential uh, tool that can be used in this time to galvanize a sense of oneness, to think about the future more than to just be stuck in this moment of, uh, of the pandemic. And I also want to hear from our distinguished guests who are joining us uh, online, maybe just bring some of their insights as well before we continue answering to this question. I'll get back to you in a minute, Beatrice. We hear from Patrick Alexis who asks, uh, how we can, how can we work together to ensure this sliding doors moment enables the future of greater inclusion and resilience rather than one of entrenched inequalities in learning? Now, this is a very important question as well. Uh, as we think about the pandemic, one big fact that has been highlighted is the, the sheer inequality that exists between those who have access and those who do not have access, either to information, to knowledge, to resources that can help them to survive. But what Patrick is asking here is, what about the future? How do we then reimagine a future where inclusion is possible and where these uh, inequalities are addressed. And probably if you can use uh, your, your creative processes, like what you've talked about earlier, Del, how you're using, for example, uh, sensitization and leaflets and all of these communication tools to reach out to audiences and to insensitize them about the pandemic. What about these issues that are more systemic, uh, more structural, 
how can we use the same approach to to pass those kind of messages or do you feel like maybe this is also something that you should you are working on or you should consider in your work Vidal. and then i will ask the same question to beatrice to as well uh, think about the same question please okay um thank you very much chris talking about um first of all i want to agree with the previous speaker um dishan if i'm right the name um arts 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 is a, is a necessary tool for information it's a necessary tool for information. In fact, for me, it is the easiest tool that you can use to pass information to people. Now, talking about um, gender sensitivity and all that, I like using my community as an example. Um, it is kind of um, partially patriarchal that um, so much attention is not given to the girl child, although organizations and um, other bodies are coming up with um, projects and works to see that the girl child is given attention. Now, looking at the future, looking at the future, grassroots development is very, very essential. In my organization, we've tried as much as we can to empower women using um, skill acquisition as, as, as a platform where we, we, we train them on various uh, vocational skills and using that they get to know that their role in the society is very, very important. Their role in the society is, 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 should not be overemphasized. Women, women are the grassroots of training and bringing up of children. Now, given that they are slightly neglected, Children spend most of their times with their parents, and it will be very, very difficult if, for instance, you neglect the girl child or the, the woman in the society because you think her role is, is minimal or she doesn't have much to offer in the society. It goes a long way to affect the children who will be leaders of tomorrow or who would, however, um, if you like, be, be stakeholders in the society tomorrow. So in my organization, we try as much as we can to say that women are inclusive in 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 in, in societal in, in society in the society. For instance, with the rise of the pandemic, um, some of the women that we've had one or two projects with have been able to sensitize. In fact, they, they've been more effective, if I may say, than, than, than the men in the society in taking out the project of spreading the awareness and sensitization, given that they are in more connection, they are more at home with the people, the children, uh, uh, the youth, and all that. So carrying out the sensitization on the part of women has been much, much more effective. This goes in a long way to explain the fact that their role is, is not something we should joke about in the society. It's Thank not something you. we should joke about in the society. And sorry, just to quickly to quickly add, um, last, uh, uh, last week, um, one of the women that we've trained in, in, in my organization uh, has gone ahead to make um, a radio broadcast program creating sensitization and awareness regarding the pandemic in, in, throughout the northwestern region of of, uh, of, of of the country using key radio stations and it has proved very 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 productive so far so we can't talk about the future we can't talk about uh, making um, uh, a level ground a foundation for everyone to to participate in decision making without talking about the women today they play a very very pivotal and vital role for us today so we must first of all look at them in the society today to create a better future tomorrow and which would help us to tackle much more other situations that may arise thank you very much indeed Del. one element that i think is very critical in what you shared is the role of women in reimagining a future that is inclusive in, in shaping a future that is uh, going to take us beyond the pandemic. And I think from the example you've shared is that there are actually, women are playing a critical role in, in doing that. And I think it's sometimes taken for granted, uh, at least in the global peace building system that is still dominated by men. And in this case, men in positions of power, men in positions of, of, of learning who have higher education. 
we tend to think that it's only them who are driving the agenda. And in fact, if we're talking about reimagining a peace building future that is equal, that is inclusive, it's indeed women who are not necessarily on the forefront of the of the, the pandemic. Women who we do not see always in the in the, in the in the media streams that are doing the big work. So let's hear as well as we wrap up. I would like also to thank all our online viewers. Thank you, Natalia from Brazil for joining us. Thank you, Dumble from Kenya for joining the call as well. Alassane from Sierra Leone for joining the call. Thank you, Prince, uh, Prince uh, for joining the call as well. Patrick, thank you so much for joining. Dominique Mwambui from Kenya, and then Farida from Afghanistan. Thank you guys for, for joining us in this conversation. Now, as we, we conclude, we are wrapping, coming close to the, the end of our call today, but I'd like to leave this opportunity for our panelists, uh, maybe starting with uh, Beatrice. If you have a final message that you'd like to share related to the power of creative responses to local peace building during COVID-19, what do you think is the power of it? And what can we do to nurture it, to make sure that it is shared, and even those who don't feel necessarily creative enough feel like they can also nurture that. So I'm just trying to say if there is any message on how can we tap on the power of creativity during this time, what message do you have? Um, we do have skills within us. We do have creative ways of doing things within us. But the only thing is we do not take time to find, to get opportunities of doing this. So this pandemic has just caught us by surprise. So what I would say is, um, <clears throat> let's, for our organization, what we need to do is, uh, like for example, most of the organization right now should consider including creative expressions in their manuals, in their activities in future, today and beyond. So it should, it should not just rest now but it should be a continuous thing even beyond the pandemic. Uh, because um, like for example, in our work, this pandemic found us doing something. We were only caught by surprise and we were wondering now, how do we in, in go on doing our work despite this pandemic? So like for example, when the art group, when the when the groups that are doing the creative ways of, I mean, are sensitizing people, we ask them, what other way, what other things? Because there are things that are going on. Like ours is to, I mean, um, to hold leaders accountable and to see, uh, like, advocate for social justice. There are issues that are going on, the domestic violences that are going on still. Like, for example, we have a community that, that uh, some areas that do not have water. We need to be washing our hands every now and then and all that. And so we are, we are being asked to be washing our hands and we do not have these services within us. So some of these youth came up with an idea and say, now we need to also include this in our drawings and just to test people, let the people know, let the community know and come and join us together in this hand in advocating for this right so that we may get this access to water. We need water. It's an important commodity that we need with us and all that so um and we like other groups that are doing sensitization through radio programs and all that as they're doing this sensitization we should not just focus on pandemic on the pandemic and all that there are other things that are going on how do you then include some of those issues sensitize people on those issues that are going on in your community apart from the pandemic and all that so these groups also as they're doing their work sensitizing on covid they should also bring out the issues mm -hmm. at the same time. So mm -hmm. what I'm encouraging people is let us in future make sure that we include some of these programs in our activities, even beyond this pandemic. It should not just rest here. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very clear message uh, of including uh, creativity in our programming, not just during, but even beyond the pandemic. One thing that as well Beatrice has highlighted is the need to also talk about other things that are happening in the community besides COVID-19. And in this case, particularly when you think about conflicts and communities that are still dealing with violence and tensions, 
these issues tend to be have been at least in most cases left on the backside while they're also important and i think this is one thing that uh british research reminded us we need to talk about let's hear as well from um, dishani if you have any comments related to how we can tap uh, tap on the power of creativity in uh, in, in dealing with covid 19. Yeah, my final thoughts are that the virus doesn't discriminate. Therefore, neither should we. And when when we are doing our work in relation to creative activities, I think the principle of do no harm is very important because we shouldn't add to the problems which are already existing right now. Rather than we should be very careful, we should be very uh, judicious about the way how we project and uh, communicate our messages. The results may not be very visible. It will take time because it's we are talking to people's minds. And uh, it may not, uh, overnight, it may not uh, bring people together. But still, it can, arts can dispel emotional barriers which exist between the communities, the boring communities. So uh, keeping that in mind, never lose hope and keep going. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that message. We should not discriminate because the virus does not discriminate. Let's not lose hope. Let's remain grounded. Let's make sure that we're using arts to dispel some negative emotions and to allow the positive in each one of us to come out. Let's hear as well from Didel as we conclude any closing remark related to this question. How can we have more creativity? in responding to the pandemic and even beyond the pandemic. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Um, thank you, Be uh, Beatrice and Deshani. Very wonderful points you raised there. Um, on my part, I would want to say, you can't talk about creativity without talking about art. Like uh, Beatrice rightly said, while we're focusing on the COVID-19, a lot of other things are happening that we might not take cognizance of. For instance, injustice, increase in crime rates, inequality, and all that. Some other things are on the rise. However, since we are faced with a pandemic, I would say um, it is worthwhile, it is worth it that in whatever we're doing, we should try to channel our resources towards the prevention of something as the pandemic. For instance, taking serious cognizance of WASH programs. Hygiene is key. And I believe if we do that, we'll be able to tackle a lot of other things. For instance, we recently had um, uh, the, the Ebola crisis that came about and all that. Nobody foresaw the, the, the coronavirus coming in. And I'm sure if drastic measures were taken at that time of the Ebola virus, the, the coronavirus wouldn't be as challenging as it is for some countries or if you like for some communities so i would want to say that whenever we are faced with a crisis like this we should look at possible way of preventing something like it that might happen in the future and that means we must try as much as we can to make our programs all inclusive all our projects all inclusive in ways that it would tackle problems like this in the future. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in today. And this was really a very enriching and very lively conversation. Thank you so much, Dishani, for joining us. I know it's really late for you there. Uh, I hope you can still find some time to go to bed and rest. <laughs> Not sure. what, what time is it for you right now, Dishani? It's uh, 7.30 p.m. Oh, 7.30, all right. So it's not, it's not that late yet. Not that but, uh, <laughs> but thank you as well to Beatrix okay. from Kenya for joining us. Thank you so much, Didel, as well, for joining. Just very last comments here as well uh, from our online viewers who have also joined in this conversation. Alassane from uh, Sierra Leone says that the issue of water to wash hands is serious, the serious problems for all of us all in the global south. So as again, connecting to the point that uh, Beatrice has raised earlier, there are so many other issues that are really important that we should use 
this opportunity using even artistic expressions and creative responses to talk to them. Then Natalia from Brazil says, I believe that a good way to inspire art and therapeutic creativity is to colonize the mercantilist concept of art as a product of capital. I believe that the feeling of not being artistic enough to even have fun comes from the wrong concept of art having to be perfect for sale and not seen as a form of expression where there is no ugly or beautiful. That's another way of bringing it that everyone should feel artistically able to, to speak what they are going through, to bring to life their emotions and to build some sense of resilience in, uh, in, in during, during this period of the pandemic and even beyond. All right, uh, we have reached the top of the time today. Thank you again, everyone, for your time, for your sharing. Again, thank you to our panelists. We'll continue this conversation within two weeks. Stay well, stay safe, and talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for Bye. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.